Well, hello, and welcome back to another episode. It's great to see you all. I hope you're doing well. So today we're continuing with our series on writing a ray tracer in C++ using as far as possible only the standard libraries, along with the SDL2 library so that we can display results in a window. Now, this is episode 23 of our series. Um, we've come a long way over the last 12 months, but the one thing that's still really holding us back is performance. And I've repeatedly talked about this, that QB Ray is not designed to be fast. It's really for illustration um, or for illustrating how ray tracing works and that kind of thing. But even so, it is still really rather slow. So over this episode and uh, the next, at least one more after this, I want to focus on performance issues and have a look at the, some fairly simple things we can do to quite significantly improve the performance. In fact, on my system, and this will of course be dependent on, on what system you're running on, ultimately we can achieve a 53% improvement in performance uh, before we even start talking about multi-threading or anything like that. So really quite significant. Okay, so uh, just to say quickly, before, as I always do before we jump into that, that uh, if you like this video, please do remember to hit that like button. And if you haven't subscribed to my channel already, then please consider doing so, so you don't have to miss any future episodes. Thank you very much. Right, well, without much further ado, let's jump into it and let's have a look at how we can make QB Ray a bit faster. Okay, so the first place I'm going to start is just at the terminal window. It's just run make, so QB Ray is, is there. And this is our default code. So you remember in the previous episode, we looked at bounding boxes and we noticed a speed improvement just by implementing bounding boxes. So what I've done is temporarily disable the code that we wrote uh, last time so that we can just establish a benchmark for the runtime. So if we run QB Ray, and let's just have a look at how long that takes. I'm going to shorten this sequence for the video. So, uh, yep. <laughs> okay, and there we go. So we see 86.1415 seconds uh, to render that scene. That's a, a fairly complicated scene, but anything like that length of time is obviously too long. Um, you know, we shouldn't really be pushing nearly a minute and a half to render something like this, even at, you know, 1280 by 720, which is the resolution of this. Okay, so let's have a look now. Last week, we looked at bounding boxes. So the first thing we're going to look at now, let's put the bounding box code back in, and let's actually have a proper look at what difference that makes to the performance. Okay, so this is the scene class, scene e21.cpp. And what I'm going to do this is exactly the same as the code that we looked at last week. I haven't changed anything except I just commented this out here. So let's put the version of the spray can back in that uses the bounding boxes. If you remember from the previous video, we declared a spray can here using the new composite base class that we created. And it's composed of the three separate shapes that make up the spray can, the cylinder, the conical top, and the cylinder for the actual, for the lid on top of the can which are then added together into the composite base shape and which then automatically generates a bounding box for that. So if we just push back the spray can into our scene and ignore the other shapes like that, let's go to our terminal window, compile, and let's see what a difference that makes. Okay, so back at the terminal window, I'm going to run make just to compile that. Okay, and let's run QB Ray again and let's see what difference we get now using bounding boxes. Again, I will shorten the sequence. Okay, and we see that was uh, 68 or 69 seconds, but actually, as uh, those of you that are paying attention will have noticed, the spray can is now in a different position, so it's not really a valid test. So let's just have a look at the code again. Okay, now the reason for that is that I forgot that when we use the composite base version of the spray can, we have to change its, uh, define its position originally at the origin, and then the composite base class has the transform. So, yep. Okay, let's, uh, let's try that again. Okay, so back at the terminal window, let's compile, and let's run again. Okay, and let's see what we get. I will shorten the sequence as before. Okay, so there we go. That's uh, now with the spray can in the correct position. And we see we have a runtime there of 72.9 seconds or 73 seconds. 
So I'll write that down, 72.93. Okay, so from 86 seconds to 73 seconds, that's pretty good. And really all we've done is put a bounding box around the spray can shape here. We haven't really done anything else. And the reason that makes it faster is that when we're casting rays into this part of the scene or this part of the scene or anywhere where we don't intersect or interact with the spray can, we're not having to test for intersections with those three objects and therefore that makes it faster. Now a bounding box is the very simplest form, I would argue, of ray tracing acceleration structure, uh, which is something that I want to go on to look at later. And you can start to see just from this the potential that acceleration structures have to make an enormous difference simply by reducing the number of intersection tests that you have to perform. I've said before that I think the number one way of improving performance in ray tracing is by minimizing the number of intersection tests you have to do because testing for an intersection takes by far you know, loads more time than anything else. Um, and I think this really rather proves that. Okay, anyway, so 73 seconds, still pretty slow and we can do a lot better. So let's go back to our code and let's have a look at what else we can do. Okay, so the first place that we're going to look is actually in the linear algebra library. Now, QB Ray is built on my own linear algebra library if you've been you know following along exactly with the series if you've substituted your own or some other third party linear algebra library which of course you could do um, then you know that these modifications are not going to count they won't make any difference however I have built my code based on my own linear algebra library it actually was the original reason I built the linear algebra library in the first place now the are quite a few um, quite significant inefficiencies within the linear algebra library and it doesn't take a great deal of thought to realize that that's going to have a massive impact on ray tracing because we're doing a lot of operations like multiplying uh, vectors together and matrices by vectors and so on so any delay that we have in that is going to be massively compounded by the ray tracing problem simply because we have to do it so often. Uh, the number one place we can make an improvement in the linear algebra library to start with is in the qbvector.h file. So this is the class for handling three-dimensional vectors. And if we go down to where we have the overloaded operators, okay, and this is a good example here. This is overloading the plus operator, which we don't do that often in ray tracing. However, it shows that the problem, what the problem is, part of the problem is, is that we're establishing these uh, result data variables as STD vector types. And then we are simply using pushback to put the result into that as we go through this loop. Now pushback is very, very slow if this is not pre-allocated because it's having to dynamically adjust or alter the size of the array as we go. So this is obviously going to be enormously inefficient. So what we can do is we can put in this new code that I've already written here. So I'm gonna comment out the original code and let's put this new code in. And see the difference now is that the new code pre-allocates the size. So it declares result data as a type QB vector um, of type T, okay, which we're getting from the template. And it pre-allocates it to the, with the size. Okay, that's really the big difference there. Uh, and yes, and then we're simply using set element. So we're not using STD vector, we're using QB vector directly. Uh, we're pre-allocating for a fixed size and we're using the set element method there and simply returning that. Okay, and then what we're gonna do is make exactly the same change everywhere. So this is overloading the minus operator. So we're going to just do that, like so. Save, and for the multiplication operator, we do the same thing, like so. Yeah, there we go. And we have this one friend function for multiply. This is to perform a scalar multiplication. We have to do that one as well, uh, just for completeness. And save that, okay. Uh, that should be it, I think, for changes to here. Yes, and those are the dot product, cross product. I think those are fine as they are. Okay, let's compile again and run, and let's see what a difference that makes. Okay, back at the terminal window. I'm going to run make clean just to uh, clean everything because the linear algebra library is a header only library. Um, make doesn't necessarily detect changes to only header files. So we're going to run through. Let's compile all the code again just to make sure we pick up on those changes that we've just made. It's 
quite a few files when we have to compile the whole thing. It's worth actually pointing out I'm already using the minus o fast flag uh, when we're compiling. That does make it take longer to compile and it means that the compiler is using things like the fast math library. It's doing all of the enhancements it can do to make our code run as fast as possible. Uh, and we're still pretty slow. So anyway, let's, uh, we've compiled that now with the new uh, changes to the QB vector class. So let's have a look at what we get now. Okay, we can immediately see that's quite a lot faster, um, but for the sake of this video, I'm going to shorten the sequence as before. Okay, and there we go. There's our result. We're now just 50 seconds. I'm just going to write that down. 50.04. Okay, so we've come from 86 seconds and we're down to 50 seconds. And we haven't really made many changes, but you can see how important it is to focus our attentions on parts of the code that are going to be called most often. And obviously, that's really going to be the linear algebra stuff. So improving the QB vector class in a very simple way has made an enormous difference to our performance, but we're still pretty slow. Um, we, we can do better. Okay, let's go back to the code. And let's see what more we can do. Okay, so the other place that we can make changes is in the QB matrix class, again from the linear algebra library. And down here, we just want to look at the assignment operator. So this is the function that is called when we are using the equals operator. Um, where is it? Uh, okay, equals equals operator and um, that. So equals equals, of course, tests for equality. The equals operator is used for assignment. So this is the original code. And the one thing that this will do is it calls through this, it deletes the data, it creates a new array and allocates the new data. And it does that every time. Now, if the size of our matrix hasn't changed, there's absolutely no need to delete it and then recreate it. Okay, so we have a new version of the code that does that. So I'm going to do comment that out. And then let's put the new code in. And you see this is pretty much exactly the same as the function above. The only difference is, it, is that it has this additional test here that if the dimensions are the same, we only need to copy the elements. We don't need to delete and reallocate the memory. Okay, so in this case, that mn rows is equal to right-hand side mn rows, that mn calls is equal to right-hand side mn calls, then we simply do a straight copy with nothing else. Uh, okay. Just that, that's the change. Okay, let's save that. Uh, let's recompile and run and let's see what difference that makes. Right, back at the terminal window, run make clean again, recompile all the code. Okay, and let's run kuberay and now let's see what we get. I'll shorten the sequence again. OK, so there we go. And we see that didn't really make any change. I mean, it actually seems to have gone up a little bit, but I'm going to put that down to random variations. So that's 50.13 seconds. OK, but we know that we have done our assignment operator more efficiently now in our QB matrix class. So we have that smug feeling of uh, inner satisfaction of having improved it. OK, so what else could we actually do to improve the performance? Now, one thing that uh, needs to be borne born in mind is that in quite a few places I've been a little heavy with the normalizations in the ray tracing. So we have every, pretty much everywhere where I've needed to use a vector for something, I've normalized it first where, you know, where the size is not relevant. And we don't actually need to do that everywhere. So let's have a look at the code and let's have a look at what normalizations we might be able to remove because normalizing a vector is a relatively expensive operation. So if we remove any unnecessary normalizations, hopefully we should be able to uh, make a difference. Let's have a look at that. OK, so the first place is in the object plane class. And we have here, we have this k.normalize here. We don't actually need that. So k is a copy of the uh, MLAB from BCK ray. So it's simply the vector from the start point to the end point of the vector. We don't actually need k.normalize. In the case of the plane, we can remove that. But we don't need to adjust anything else. Everything else there works just as it is. So let's save that. OK, let's have a look at the next function we can improve. OK, object sphere is the next place. So uh, a bit more we can change here. So here we have vhat.normalize. So we're, again, we're normalizing the same thing. 
And if we do normalize it, it means, of course, we don't need to worry about calculating a value for a. If you remember back from the episode a long time ago now on uh, ray tracing spheres, we calculate a, b, and c uh, to use for the b squared minus 4ac test. It's a basic solution of a quadratic equation. If we know that v hat is always normalized, then we can just set a to 1. However, of course, normalizing a vector is actually more expensive than simply doing this extra multiplication. Okay, so what we're going to do, let's comment out that, and we need to comment out that line and put that one in. So now we're setting a is now equal to the dot product of v hat with itself, okay? And that is quicker to do than normalizing, right? And then we also have to change this line here to make sure we have the a in it. I think in the original version it didn't have that. And that's it. The other thing I have done is I changed square root f to square root. I don't know if that really makes an improvement to performance, but square root f, I think, internally will cast everything to doubles, um, which is not necessarily what we want. In our case, we are using doubles anyway, so arguably it doesn't make any difference, but it just seems tidier to use square root, so I have changed that as well. Anyway, let's save that. Okay, okay so that's an example of uh, removing unnecessary normalization. So we've done that for the plane, and we've done it for the sphere class. Let's save that, let's compile and run it, and let's see how we're doing now. Okay, let's just run make. We've only changed the CPP file, so we can just run make directly. So on QB Ray again, and let's see what our runtime is now. Again, I'll shorten the sequence. Okay, so there we go. We've got a runtime now 49.45 seconds, so a little bit better. Um, arguably, that could also just be random variation. We should properly do a you know best of three, but it has made a bit of a difference. And of course we are rendering, there are a few planes there. There aren't actually any spheres in this scene. <laughs> so um, yeah, uh, yes, there we go. So that does indeed make a difference. Now, as it turns out, there is one other area where the way I've written the code makes it far slower than it needs to be. And that is actually how we calculate the specular highlights because what I've done is I've written separate functions for calculating the diffuse color for a material and then a separate function for calculating the specular highlight. And the gross inefficiency there is that it means we're having to cast rays to our light sources twice. We cast once within when we calculate the diffuse color to see whether we're in shadow or not and to get the intensity and color of the light. And then when we call the function to do the specular highlights, we are doing the same thing again. We're casting rays out to the light sources, checking for intersections and so on. That's hugely inefficient. Let's have a look at how we can make that better. Okay, so I come to the material base class now. First of all, material based on HPP, because we're going to add an extra function. So whereas before we've had compute diffuse color here, and then at the moment the compute specular color is in the specific material implementations. That's something that could be done much tight in a more tidy fashion. However, what I've now done is we've added a new function to material base to the base class called compute spec and diffuse, which does exactly what you might expect, simultaneously calculates both the specular and the diffuse components, therefore requiring only one set of rays to be cast around the scene in order to achieve that, which is going to be a lot more efficient. Okay, so that's the function declaration. It follows the same format as the others. Uh, yep, so except we have an additional thing that we need to pass. The, a point. Diffuse color doesn't need to know the ray, but we do need to know the ray for calculating the specular component, so we do have that there. Okay, let's have a look at the material, material base class CPP file. There we go. Okay, so this is material-base.cpp, and we're going to scroll down. That's all our definition, the original diffuse class, cast ray, assign texture, and so on. And this is our new function. So this is the function that does the combined operation of computing the specular and diffuse lighting components, okay? So the first thing we do is we calculate the diffuse component pretty much as before. So for every light source in our scene, we call the compute illumination function from that light source. Uh, that will take care of casting the ray between where we are, uh, our intersection point, given our local normal, and it will cast that out to that particular light source, the current light. Okay, 
Uh, we then calculate the diffuse component exactly as we did before. Okay, simply add the color multiplied by the intensity. We get those back. We've talked about all that before. Okay, and now what we're going to do is also calculate the specular component at the same time. And this means that we do not need to cast another ray. So this is inside this if statement, which checks if we have valid illumination. So if light from this light source is reaching this point, then we do everything. So we know we have to calculate the specular. If the uh, m specular value and the m shininess values are greater than zero, then we will do something with the specular, otherwise we can ignore it. We initially set specular intensity to zero, and then we construct a vector pointing from the intersection point to the light, okay? Because we know where the light is, we can get current light dot m location. Uh, we compute our start point with a small displacement, so we're slightly above the surface. And then we simply construct a ray from the point of intersection to the light, okay? and we compute the reflection vector for that ray, uh, remembering to remove the unnecessary normalization there that we talked about just now. Uh, we're then gonna compute the dot product between that ray and the ray from the camera, or the ray from the origin, from wherever we happen to be <laughs> our intersecting ray is coming from. And then that is what we use to calculate the specular intensity using the standard formula. And then we simply use uh, this system here to calculate the spec green, red, green, and blue components respectively. Down here we have, if illumination is found, we uh, modify diffuse color accordingly and spec color uh, accordingly like so. And then we set the ambient light. Now this is slightly different to the code that we've used before. Uh, this is simply adding the ambient light components, the color multiplied by the intensity, multiplied by uh, the base color and so on to the diffuse color, and then we simply add the specular component to the diffuse component, and that gives us our output color. Okay, so we can tell immediately that's just going to be faster, because instead of having to cast rays out into the scene to our light sources twice every time, we are now just doing it once, so we would expect that to make um, a fairly significant difference. Let's just have a quick look at the simple material class where we implement this, just to show how we do that. Okay, so this is simple material.cpp and come down to compute color. So this is where we now call the new function. So before we called to compute diffuse color to give diff color, and then separately down here, uh, we calculated the spec color using the specular component and then we added them here. So what we're going to do is comment those lines out like so. Uh, so we're now using the new method, we're using the new compute spec and diffuse function. Uh, notice this slightly different syntax here as well, that we get the texture color from the get texture color function directly, uh, and then pass that into here. Okay, and what we need to do now, we no longer need to compute the specular component separately here, so we can comment that code out and then we simply return material color. So that change will mean that everywhere where we have a material that has specular and diffuse color components, we're now going to use the new compute spec and diffuse function, which will only cast one set of rays into the scene. So let's go back to our terminal, let's compile, run, and see what a difference that makes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so back at the terminal window, let's gonna run make clean because I've made changes to the header files. Sometimes that's a good idea to do that. Let's let that run through and compile everything. Okay, and let's run QB Ray and let's see what we get now. Okay, so we immediately see that it's quite a lot faster. Um, in fact, I'm not going to bother shortening the sequence this time because it is so much faster than before. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's still a bit on the slow side probably as ray tracing goes. I know there are real time ray tracers out there and I do note that mostly though those tend to just do spheres and maybe planes that tend to be quite simple. But anyway, let's have a look. So we're nearly there now. <laughs> and there we go. You see, that's the same scene. Everything looks as it should, rendered in just 35 seconds or 34 point six four seconds so with just those few relatively small changes we've taken our rendering time for this scene which is a fairly complicated scene i mean admittedly we're not doing path tracing or anything complicated like that yet but we've taken our rendering time for that from 86 seconds 
down to 35 seconds simply by making a few changes to our code, which I think is quite substantial. So I think this takes us quite some way to um, tackling the performance issues with QB Ray. There probably are other improvements that are possible, but as I've said before, my intention has never been to write a real-time ray tracer or anything like that. So um, I'm not necessarily going to explore improving the code base uh, too much more in terms of performance. Um, I might do, we'll, we'll see how we go. The one other thing that I do want to do in terms of addressing the performance issue is to look at multi-threading. So at the moment, uh, we are just running in a single thread. Now I have a six core, uh, 12 thread CPU in my computer. So that is obviously very wasteful. And if we run my private version, which is fully multi-threaded, you can see that it is even faster still. So let's just have a quick look at that. Let's close this one. Let's go to my private version and you'll see what I mean. OK, so this is my development version, which is always a few episodes ahead of where we are. Um, I'm going to just run that. It does have a slightly different syntax. And let's see, let's render the same scene and see the difference. Uh, you see, the way it renders being multi-threaded is different. And <laughs> there we go, just 5.7 seconds. OK, so that is the power of multi-threading that in principle we can go from 86 seconds if we were to include the multi-threading into that down to 5.7. Now I haven't talked about implementing multi-threading in this video because I think there's enough to talk about there that really means that should be its own video and that's very much my intention for the next episode. So we next episode focus on multi-threading and then I think we're starting to get towards uh, some fairly decent performance levels. So there we go. That's really everything that I wanted to talk about today. I have been promising for a while to talk about performance issues with QB Ray. So there we go. We've now done that and we've addressed some of the major bottlenecks. Um, we've managed to yield really quite significant improvements from 86 seconds down to 34 seconds um, for uh, that particular scene, which is pretty substantial. Uh, it's quite possible that we could make further improvements to that, and that may be something I go on to look at again more in the future. The next episode, um, hopefully coming next week, but it might take me a bit longer, we'll see, um, we'll look at multi-threading, and then we can really start to make full use of the CPU that we have available, uh, which obviously leads to even further improvement. Anyway, that's for next week. So there we go. As I say, I really hope you've enjoyed this video. I've had a great deal of pleasure making it. Um, if you have liked this video, then please do remember to hit that like button. And if you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, then do please consider doing so, at the very least so that you don't have to miss the next episode on multi-threading, which I think is quite an interesting topic. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Anyway, listen, just needs me to say, I, it's been a pleasure. Really hope you've enjoyed it. And I really look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.